ready for BBS. And yeah, stuff on the screen got shrunk so that things will fit for BBS with all the display work there. So thank you for your patience in working with us with an unusual day. Often at Christmas time, you hear the comment made, it ought to be Christmas every day of the year. And then we do nothing about it. We're doing something about it today. It's June and we're going to be preaching from the Christmas story today. Christmas in the summertime. Most of us have seen a pageant at one time or another during the Christmas season when a little boy comes in as Joseph dressed in a bathrobe and sneakers. He anxiously taps on the door of the inn and the innkeeper dressed in a kind of toe sack robe answers indicating that there is no room in the crowded inn. The innkeeper looks at Mary and nods his head and shrugs his shoulders and says, Sorry. Joseph and Mary turned away. But what if? What if that story got tweaked somehow? What if there was an interruption in the story? What if a booming voice out of heaven calls out to the innkeeper and says, Hey, buddy, do you know who you're turning away? Hey, do you know that for centuries they're going to make plays about you and you're going to be the bad end of a lot of jokes? <laughs> Maybe the innkeeper would have changed his mind. Maybe he would have done something different. But would we really want that? I mean, if that hadn't happened, would, would we have still had angels singing in the sky? Would there still be announcements to shepherds in a field? Would there, would there still be the deep voice of a deacon or a preacher every Christmas play that says, And the Word was made flesh and dwelt amongst us. How would we get along without all that? Let me ask you a more serious question. Have you ever thought about what would be different if Jesus Christ had never been born? What if the story of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, what if it never happened? Have you ever thought about what life and the world would be like if none of it happened? First thing I can tell you is this would not be 2012. Our calendar changed because of the birth of Jesus. This would not be 2012. I, I don't know. What would it have been? I don't know. Can you imagine life without Christmas celebrations? Can you imagine December and no Christmas? You would just have my birthday to celebrate. <laughs> how, about, how, how about no Easter break during school? How about no Thanksgiving? You see, really, without Christmas, the motivation behind Thanksgiving would have never, ever happened. We would have never heard one Christmas carol sung, Joy to the World, Silent Night, O Holy Night. None of those songs would have ever been written. There would be no Christmas place, no vacation Bible school. There'd be no reason to have one, no summer camp. You would have never heard of famous people World changers. William Tyndale, John Knox, Martin Luther, no Billy Graham, no Elizabeth Elliot, no Major Ian Thomas, no Corey Tinboom or the writer of one of the songs we just sang, Blessed Assurance, no Fanny J. Crosby, no C.S. Lewis, no Chuck Colson. None of those folks would ever be known. There would be no organizations like the Gideons. Can you imagine a motel room without a Bible? <laughs> Gideons wouldn't exist. No Red Cross. No St. Agnes Hospital. No Salvation Army ministry in every town. No prison fellowship going into prisons, letting them know there is good news in their bad situation. No New Hope Church. We wouldn't exist. We would not have such books to read like 
the tale of two cities, Dickens would have never written the Christmas Carol. And quite frankly, folks, do you realize we wouldn't have even had the Grinch who stole Christmas? <laughs> there was no Christmas. Would have never happened. There'd be no movies like Ben Hur, White Christmas, Chariots of Fire, no Chronicles of Narnia, no Passion of Christ by Gibson. You and I would have never, ever heard the song. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound without Christmas. There would never be a song, How Great Thou Art. No modern day chorus like Great is Our God or God with Us. No blessed assurance. Do you realize there might be no America? I mean, no pilgrims would have been looking for a continent and where they could express the freedom to worship God according to their conscience. They would have never come here. The Wawani Indians of Ecuador would still kill white men and each other. The Awaka Indians of the Caribbean would still be cannibals. Descendants of the Mayans in Mexico would still sacrifice their children instead of teaching their children to praise the Creator. The entire New Testament, Matthew through Revelation, would have never, ever been written. For those of us who believe all of this, there would have been no mediator between God and man if Christ had not been born. And you and I would be dead in our trespasses and our sins, hopeless. And help us. I don't know about you, but I don't like that picture. John chapter 1, verse 14, or you may find this in page 309 in the story. If you would like to turn there, that's chapter 22 in the story. If, um, if you are joining us for the very first time today, you're saying, what's this book? I thought you all preached from the Bible. Well, this is the Bible. This is a Bible that's been specially arranged in chronological order. It omits all the duplications that we have in Scripture. In other words, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, which have a lot of the same things. It's only told once in the story. Puts it in time sequence so that it makes sense to us. And we are preaching through the entire Bible in 32 weeks. And we have just finished the Old Testament and we are just launching into the New Testament. Do you all realize... That 22 weeks ago, we started in Genesis chapter 1. As we started looking at history, his story in life. <laughs> Scripture says God created the heavens and the earth. God created the heavens and the earth. He created man and he created woman. And he would come down in the cool of the evening and he would have fellowship with them. He would meet with them. He would visit with them. He would talk with them. He would share his wisdom with them. And then Adam and Eve messed up the good deal. They made a decision that they wanted to be like God, knowing good from evil. They only knew good. They wanted to know evil. And that damaged the relationship and Things changed, but what did not change was the heart of God. The mind and attitude of man changed. What did not change was the heart of God. And the heart of God was, I still want to spend time with my creation. I still want to hang out with men and women. And God's heart has not changed. And that is what the Christmas story is all about. God revealing to us, His heart has not changed. He wants to come and hang out with us. John, chapter 1. Verse 14, the Word became flesh. That's the last sentence on page 309. The Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. John tells the Christmas story a little bit different than Matthew and Luke. He kind of gives it to us from God's perspective instead of man's perspective. The Word, who is God, was made flesh. God coming to hang out with us. Just as God came into the garden at the beginning of time, Jesus, God, coming to be born as a man, living amongst men. Why? So God could hang out 
with his creation. That's why he did it. The word, interesting word. The word's an interesting word. How do you say that so it sounds exciting? The word! An interesting word. <laughs> Unlike other words used for word. Unique rendering here, it's the logos, L-O-G-O-S from the Greek. It's the logos. Not, not your average run-of-the-mill everyday word for word. See, logos, long before the birth of Jesus, two different Greek philosophers honed in on the importance and the value of this word called logos. One of these Greek philosophers was a guy by the name of Heraclitus. Heraclitus. He was from Ephesus. He is known for the doctrine of change that's central to the universe as stated in his famous quote. Listen to this. You cannot step twice into the same river. And he got paid a lot of money to think like that. <laughs> but think about how rather profound it is. You may step in at the same place from the riverbank, but you never step in to the same river because it's always moving. It is always changing. He said all things, all things in this changing world must come in accordance with the logos, the word, with reason. That means logos is the omnipotent wisdom by which all things are steered in time. Now that was Heraclitus' comment about this incredible word, logos, <coughs> the word. The other one, where many of you, any, any, anybody ever heard of Heraclitus of Ephesus? Any, any, any? He really did exist. Check him out. Google him if you'd like to, right in the middle of the sermon. Go ahead. <laughs> The other one, almost all of you will have heard of, and you probably studied him some. His name is Plato. <coughs> Not the Disney character Pluto. <laughs> this is the Greek philosopher Plato. He actually said that someday there will come forth from God a word, a logos, who will reveal all the mysteries and he will make everything plain. And this predates Jesus Christ. Now John... The Gospel writer says, the beginning of all creation is with the Logos. The Word, the Logos of God, has become flesh and blood. You see, for the Greeks, He was the reason who became flesh. All reasoning now is embodied in this person, Jesus Christ. For the Hebrews, He was the Creator from Genesis chapter 1, who has now become flesh and lives in their midst. And for all of us today, who go by the name of Christian, the Logos is God becoming a man. The Word, who is God, is revealed in the person of Jesus Christ. Referring again to the story, page 309 and 310. First sentence on page 309. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the word was God. This identifies personally the person born as Jesus Christ, one who was born, yet he is the eternal God. No mistake about it. No question. And the word became flesh. He made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and full of truth. The Christ that is being talked about here, has been around as long as God has been. He is eternal. In fact, Jesus was the Genesis Word. How did God create the universe? Do you remember? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And how did He do that? God said, let there be. And there was. Let there be light. And there was. Let there be land. And there was. Let there be sea creatures and fish and, and animals that roam the land. And there was, God said, and there was the Word, the Logos of creation. John is saying that the voice which said, let there be, 
was the voice of Jesus speaking. The Apostle Paul, who wrote the bulk of our New Testament, would later in the New Testament say that Jesus was the firstborn of all creation. He was there before creation even happened. Peter would agree with both John and Paul, and he said that God the Father chose Jesus the Son for this purpose long before the world ever began. These writers agree that Jesus' first blush with earth was not in Bethlehem 2,000 years ago, but it occurred at the very beginning of time. We wonder, or at least I wonder, I don't know if you did when you read chapter 22 this week, but did you wonder at all if, have we already seen the Logos? Have we already seen Jesus in our study of the story in the Old Testament? Has He already shown up in the scene before today? I, I mean, do you remember the story of Jacob? Remember the two brothers, Jacob and Esau? Do you remember the story of Jacob when he got into a wrestling match with an angel on the muddy banks of the Jabbok River? Do you remember that story? Do you remember Jacob said, I'm not going to turn you loose until you bless me. And then he poked him in the hip and he walked with a limp for the rest of his life. And he never forgot that. Was that just some ordinary old angel coming out of the clouds? Thank you guys. Give me a living illustration today. <laughs> or was Jacob wrestling with Jesus Christ, the Word? Was that Jesus when Joshua, as he was approaching the city of Jericho, and all this gigantic commander in chief of an angelic host, and the scripture says Joshua fell on his face? And he worshipped him. Was he not in an encounter with the Jesus who wants to be with us? Was that Jesus when Abraham gave those mysterious offerings to a priest? <coughs> that the scripture says, we have no record of this priest's birth. We have no knowledge of his death. He seems to be forever. And they called him Melchizedek. Testament name for the fact that Abraham saw Jesus. Remember that sermon Gene preached to you about those three incredible young men by the name of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? Remember those guys who wouldn't bow, who wouldn't bend, who wouldn't burn? Remember they got tossed in that fiery furnace and when the king looked in, he said, I thought I told you three, but I see four and the fourth one looks like who? The Son of God. Guys, the heart of God in his story is that he be with us. And Bethlehem is not the first time he reveals it. He's been doing it ever since creation in Genesis chapter 1. Jesus was with Abraham and he was with Jacob and he was with Joshua and those three Hebrew children. And now, now in chapter 22 of the story, Jesus is with us. Do you remember what the angel said to Joseph, you shall call his name Jesus. Jesus. Emmanuel, specifically in that passage. And then he, he explains what Emmanuel means. What does it mean? God with us. This Jesus, this Jesus in Bethlehem is the one who had been at the Jabbok River. He's the one who had been in the fiery furnace. He's the one who had been on the side of the mountain when, when Sarah laughed at the thought that at her age she could become pregnant. Jesus was the one who's been there all along. And now he makes it clear. The desire of my heart is to be God with you. And I'm here to prove it to you. That's the Christmas story. This Jesus of Bethlehem, this Jesus of chapter 22, this Jesus of the Logos word of the Gospel of John, He's the one who was made flesh. He has teeth and He has toenails. He has two kidneys. He would have shared one with you. Bruce, He would have given you one. He's not part man and part God. He is fully human and He is fully God. Huh? Let me say it again. 
He is fully God. And He's fully human. Does that, do you understand that? Because I don't. It's kind of like being a codependent. You can't really explain it. Uh -huh. I don't really understand electricity. I understand turning on a switch and the lights work. I've had electricians explain to me how electricity works. And you know what? I still don't understand it. And you know what my real conclusion is? They don't understand it either. Okay? They, they don't. They, they tell you this is what you do and this is what the outcome is, but I don't think they understand really how it works. You've got a positive, you've got a negative, you've got a ground, and why as a result of all of that, you end up with power. They don't really understand. I mean, let's be honest. We understand that if you take a positive and you add a negative to it, you end up with nothing. Okay, they counter off it. But, but not, not electricity. You put the two together, and man, you've got an explosion of power. We, we, you could give me a script, and I could read to you how electricity works, but just because you say this is how it works, do you really fully understand it? No, and that's the way it is with God. Here's what the Apostle Paul said in 1 Timothy 3.16. He said, without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. God became a man. Major Ian Thomas took that verse and wrote a whole book on it called The Mystery of Godliness. And in that book, he summarizes that great, incredible mystery with this one simple sentence. Jesus Christ, never, ever less than God. Jesus Christ, never, ever more than man. How can you never be less than God never more than man at the same time. That's why he's God, and you're not. He does what we cannot understand. The mystery of godliness has baffled some of the greatest minds in the history of the church. The 4th century bishop, Hippo Augustine, declared this mystery, listen to this, in a Christmas sermon. Let me give you one paragraph in June from a Christmas sermon written hundreds of years ago. This is good. Hippo, can you imagine calling him, hey Hippo, <laughs> most of us would get slapped if we thought that was his name. His mother was intoxicated the night he was born. <laughs> I'm kidding, I have no idea. She needed to celebrate recovery, I think. <laughs> Here's a sermon. He, Jesus Christ, through whom time's made, is now made in time. He. Jesus Christ, older by eternity than the world itself, was younger in age than many of his servants in the world. He, Jesus Christ, the one who made man, was made man. He was given existence by a mother whom he brought into existence. He was carried in hands which he formed. He nursed at breasts which he filled with milk. He cried like a babe in a manger in speechless infancy. This word without which human eloquence is speechless. Wow. Did he capture the mystery of godliness? And then the 15th century reformer, Martin Luther, most of us have heard of him, he said the mystery of the humanity of Christ, that he sunk himself into our flesh, is beyond all human understanding. But that is the story of God in its full consistency from Genesis all the way to John, all the way to you and me. God with us. In our day, J.I. Packer, has written about the mystery of this incarnation, and he said it this way, the Almighty appeared on earth as a helpless human baby. Needed to be fed, needed his diaper changed, needed to be taught like a child how to speak. The more you think about it, the more staggering it gets. Nothing in fiction is as fantastic as the truth of the incarnation. The miracle of Christmas is that God came in human flesh to live with us. This is the wonderful truth of John 1, 14. And the Word was made flesh, and He lives with us. This Word, this incredible mystery of godliness, 
He was born in an ordinary way to an ordinary person for ordinary people. You understand that? Jesus came in the most ordinary fashion so that he was available to every single one of us. The only folks who do not want a relationship with an ordinary Jesus are those who think too highly of themselves. They think they're too extraordinary to accept someone who came in such an ordinary way. If that's a problem for you, if you think you're too good for a Savior who was born in a stable, will it make you feel any better to know that when He comes the next time, He is going to come not in secret but on public display. He is not going to come born as a baby, but He's going to come as a reigning, triumphant, victorious King. Is that good enough for you? King. King. Yeah, king. However you all say it. Okay. A prince who's been promoted. Is it good enough for you again? But he came ordinarily, born of a young virgin girl, because we needed help in being born again. What was his earthly father's name? Joseph. Just a, just a regular Joe. Yeah. That was his dad. By the way, you all know we have Joseph and Mary in our church, right? They were in the 8 o'clock service. They get up early. <laughs> and let me tell you, if there was ever a regular Joe, that's our Joseph. I promise you that. This earthly father of Jesus was so regular. He didn't have any clout. He didn't have any cash. He didn't have any credit. He didn't have any strings he could pull. Quite frankly, this Joe didn't have any friends he could call in the calamity he was facing of a fiance who he had never had sex with, who said she was a virgin, and yet she was pregnant, and she was going to have the baby of God. He said, if you believe that story, I've got some swamp land for sale. <laughs> but if it hadn't been for an angel, came to Joe and said, hey, it's true. And I've already got the name picked out. Joseph was so regular, he had nobody else to go to. Jesus' birth was truly humble. The word, Jesus. It started with the innkeeper. Many would turn him away. Not just the innkeeper, but it started with him. Many, many turned away from Jesus. They turned from his birth. They turned from his life. They turned away from his crucifixion. They turned away from him in his risen, reigning life. The innkeeper was not the only one, he was just the first. We can only imagine what went through his head as he rejected Jesus, claiming, it is too crowded to have a pregnant woman here. This world still seems to be too crowded to receive Jesus. We are crowded with deadlines and headlines and phone lines and long lines, full itineraries, full schedules, jam-packed lives. Is your life, is your life too crowded? Jesus. Simply don't have time. I, I, I mean, after all, I got an answer to the phone. I lost my phone the other day for about three hours. The best three hours I've had in a long time. It's great. Jesus comes not to complicate our lives. They're complicated already. Jesus comes to simplify our lives. In fact, He comes in the midst of our complicated lives to give us real life. Let me begin to wrap this up. Jesus coming in great humility, His birth and His life being lived in such humble means. Jesus, the maker of the universe, the one who invented time, the one who gave you breath, the breath you just took, He gave you. The one who owns everything, He comes humbly. Jesus comes humbly enough to understand what you've been through this week. What crap and crud have you lived with this week? <clears throat> it wasn't so cruddy and it wasn't so crappy that Jesus won't walk through it with you. 
He comes humbly enough to understand what kept you awake last night. But it's okay. I'm glad you could come here and sleep a while this morning. It's fine. <laughs> We're humble enough to accept that. It's, okay. it's humble enough to say, he looks at you and he says, I know what that's like. He's humble enough that when an immigrant from Ethiopia prays, or a squatter in Brazil offers a plea for help, that the Almighty God does not shake his finger and say, I wish to get your act together. But he remembers the pain of a hungry belly. Jesus remembers the chill of a cold night. He remembers what it's like to lay down on a hard ground with not even a rock to serve as a pillow for his head. He knows what it's like to hear his parents tell the story of the night of his birth and say, yeah, because Mary was pregnant, we couldn't even get a hotel room to stay in. He knows what it's like to hear the rejection. But he's humble enough to come to us all. His world is not too crowded for you. I don't care if there is an immigrant from Ethiopia or a squatter in Brazil or a Clovis is a way of life citizen. Praying to him, he hears every single one of us. His life is not too crowded for you. Our world is crowded with those headlines and deadlines and our concern over our waistlines. Our schedules are full, our itinerary is busy, our responsibilities are overflowing, anxiety cups fill up. Sounds like a lot of us need celebrate recovery. You should have said amen, Eric. Yeah. All right. Just <laughs> slow. So sweet. Christ comes in the midst of our crowded world and he knocks on the door of our hearts. What is our response? I don't have time right now, Jesus. You remember Akeen in the New Testament who said, now's not the time. I'll wait for a more convenient occasion. Jesus does not come to complicate our life. He comes to simplify it. In your busy world, you say, I don't have time for God. I don't have time for worship. I don't have time for prayer. I don't have time for Bible study. I'm going to make every single one of you a promise today. In your busy schedules, every single one of you will find time to die. You will. You will find time to die. And it may not be an old age for all of you. And so what will you do with that time when it comes? Because after that, there is an eternity. And the question is, heaven or hell? Time with God? Or will you live eternity the way you lived your life without time for Him? He comes to simplify our life. We get our sins dealt with. We get our death defeated. We get our eternal future defined. Life takes on very much a good clarity all of a sudden. If the Christ in your heart is not simplifying your life, I suggest to you, Christ may not be in your life. It's a counterfeit. It's a con man. And folks, I also want you to know it's never too late to come to Him. I've had people tell me at 50 and 60 and 70 and 80 years of age, you know what, I've lived this way all my life. I can't change now. I'd be a hypocrite to change now. No, you wouldn't. You'd be smart. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You'd have been smarter to have done it sooner. <laughs> but you'd be stupider to do it later. Now, it wasn't too late for Abraham, and he was pushing triple digits when he had his first child of promise. It wasn't too late for Moses. He was already retired when God gave him his most fruitful years. It wasn't too late for the thief on the cross minutes before he died. He got in just in the nick of time. I wouldn't push my luck that far. <laughs> the stories of the Bible are stories of people who have pushed the time limits of God, but it was never too late for any of them. Some people miss Jesus because they're waiting for something supernatural, a sign from heaven, a headline-grabbing miracle. But Jesus comes, folks, to the common places. In creation, he came to the garden. In birth, he came to the stable. Jesus coming in the way he did is similar to what Spurgeon said about sermons that we preach. 
Charles Haddon Spurgeon, one of the most brilliant minds that ever preached the Word of God, said, gentlemen, when you preach God's Word, put the food on the bottom shelf so that the smallest, the weakest, the least educated can all feed. If you put it on the top shelf, only a few will find it. Put him on the bottom shelf. Why? Because he came common. He came ordinary. He came humbly. Jesus comes to common places like Bethlehem. To a common Joe father. He comes on the back of a common donkey to a common manger in a common stable to common folks like shepherds in the womb of a girl so common she probably still had pimples when he was born. But when God picks his way of coming, he comes to the common things of life. He comes to common centers. Mm -hmm. Folks, if you didn't know who the pastor was today and you just saw me walking through the crowd, I'm just a BBS teacher. You're just a man or a woman, a husband or a wife. God comes to every one of us and he comes commonly so that no one feels intimidated. I love the story that is told of the great German reformer of the 16th century, Martin Luther. Remember, Martin Luther was a priest. When accused by Satan of being a sinner, Martin Luther said, Thanks, devil! You've told me I'm a sinner, and the Bible tells me Christ died for sinners. I've got the solution to my problem. That's the confidence you and I can have today. A forgiveness that will save us from ourself and from our sins. What if Jesus had never been born? One thing for sure is, neither you nor I would be here today. There'd be no church for us to gather in. There'd be no message for us to hear. There would be no hymns for us to sing. There would be no reason for us to pray. This is a special moment. Are you ready to receive? an uncommon Savior who came in an uncommon way so that any one of us can have an incredible, awesome future. Again, it was Major Thomas who said, you can't be too poor to come to Jesus. You could only be too rich and you don't think you need Him. You can't be too sinful to come to Jesus. You could only think that you're too good that you have no reason for Jesus to come in your life. You can't be too uneducated to come to Jesus. You can only think you're too smart and you have no need for it. Jesus comes for every one of us. Have you let him come for you? Have you ever invited him personally into your life? In our closing prayer this morning, why don't you do that? I'm not going to make you raise your hand. I'm not going to invite you to come forward. I'm not going to ask you to do anything, but in the quietness of this moment, in your own heart, say, Lord Jesus, wow, I didn't realize how different this world would be if it wasn't for the Christ of Christmas. And I've postponed too long inviting you to come live within me. I've been made aware there will be room for my death in life. I want to make room in my life for the answer to death. I want to invite Jesus Christ to come live within me. The vast majority of you I know already know Christ, but here's a question for us. In our Christian life, have we become too busy for what Christ wants to do in us? Have you, by your busyness, pushed him out? Why don't you acknowledge that to him today and say, Lord, I'm your, I want my life simplified. I want you to sit on the throne direct the activities and affairs of my life. Let's pray. Dear Father, you know our hearts. You know our needs. You know our relationship with you. You know whether it's healthy or it's unhealthy. You know whether we have one or whether we don't. And God, here's the deal. Even though there's about 200 folks sitting in here, you're not too busy to hear every one of our prayers. You're not too busy to respond to every one of our needs. In fact, you are listening, listening, looking, looking for any heart, for any thought, for any mind of any boy or any girl who says, God, I want to be right with you. 
Thank you that you're listening. Thank you that you're forgiving. Thank you that you're restoring. Thank you you're ready to start a new life in them. Father, as they have questions about this new life, may they seek somebody out, whether it's here or elsewhere, who has an incredible love with you to help provide them answers to the deepest needs. Thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Guys, may I point out?